When I first started flying lessons, I was just turning 16. I did it early in the morning between 6 and 7 o'clock in the summertime. My first experience was in a small airplane and at the time we had no radio communications and so we had green lights and red lights. As soon as I got my 40 hours in, I got my license. Now this is 7-5 Romeo right north of uh, Air. Fairman's Point with November request permission to tax for a west departure of it. Goodbye, very west. Thank you very much. Ed is genuine, authentic, 100% Alaskan. He's a person that you can shake his hand and you know that agreement is solid gold. He and his foundation have changed a lot of lives in a lot of communities and very often without a lot of fanfare. He has built philanthropic infrastructure in the state of Alaska and that's a hard thing to do. He gives so much money outside of the Rasmussen Foundation for funding for the arts, for funding for homelessness. There's been some personal things in Ed and Kathy's life that haven't been a cakewalk. He doesn't make a big deal out of that, and people that aren't around him wouldn't know. People have said to me, to know and appreciate Ed, you have to know Elmer. His father was a tough taskmaster. Would Ed have chosen to be a banker in life? Probably not. I mean, his love is the humanities, but he has a huge sense of duty. And when duty called, he came to take over his dad's place and run the bank and did it very well. And I think that running the bank was crucial to how he saw to run the foundation, that the foundation was not just a benevolent overlord. The foundation was there to help people help themselves. I've told a couple of governors, if Ed ever calls you, take his call, because he never wants anything for himself. It's always for the good of Alaska. The plane that I fly the most is a 206 on floats. It's a Cessna, got a, uh, a more powerful engine in it. I've extended the wing tips to it so that uh, it can take off at uh, slower speeds, land at slower speeds, and it's a good airplane. All set. As soon as I get in that airplane, all the cares that I think about and the problems I have immediately go away because I have to, uh, I have to fly.
I've uh, run too many meetings uh, as a chairman of the board of this, chairman of the board of that, and I and I know how to run meetings, but I don't like to necessarily be in the limelight continuously. Just leave me alone, you know. One of the things that's great about Ed is even though he's an introvert, he shows up. He makes things happen. He does what he needs to do. Put fish on the board here and uh, fillet it. And uh, then I can put, it, put uh, the fillet in the cryback bags. He's authentic and he's generous and he's giving. He is so passionate and cares about the state so much that he's like, well, I need to get in there and help out. Ed is doing it for the state. And I do think that's what he thinks about in the middle of the night, is what could he do to make it better. I do this for salmon. I get over at uh, Golden Horn or McGowan Sitka. And uh, I bring it back H&G uh, uh, head and gutted, and then I can fillet it here and what have you. Dad was president and chairman of the board of National Bank of Alaska until the sale of the bank, July 14, 2000. And then Elmer passed away on December 1st, 2000. And that's when Ed took over as chairman of the Rasmussen Foundation Board. Dad did serve on many boards. The Alaska Board of Regents for the University of Alaska, the Sheldon Jackson College, and APU, Alaska Pacific University. Yeah, I think he's the only guy that has served on all three boards. We build a special place out here for uh, smoking. I can make strips, I can smoke, uh, and I've got the fans, and it's, you know, it smells very smoky in here, obviously. The natural resources of Alaska is very important to him, and he had an opportunity to serve on the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council. But I think his most important contribution, his legacy, is going to be how he's built the culture of philanthropy in Alaska. And it helps set the example for all Alaskans, not just those you know with means, but everyone, to be more engaged in giving back. The Rasmussen's are here to help out. Sometimes we can't do everything that we would like, but we're certainly involved with every facet of the state. We've grown from a, one or two people in the foundation to around 24. We're giving away approximately $500,000 a week now throughout the state. So I'm very proud of that. He's just big on life. He just goes big. We all know him as Big Ed, and it's not because he's a big guy. He's not a big guy, but he's got a big personality and a big appetite. It speaks to who he is in a room. You want to hear what he has to say, what he's thinking, and his love of this state is really, it is big and it shows in his hobbies and in what he wants to do and who his friends are and who he wants to talk to. He, he's as comfortable talking to an uh, airplane mechanic or a guy who's a commercial fisherman as talking to another financier. Ed knows so many people in the state and knows all the stories behind everything. When somebody comes to him, he'll know not only who that person is, but probably who their parents were. That's exactly right. I think that's one of the strengths of our foundation, our foundation board. He wants to make Alaska a better place. He wants to continue the Alaska that we all grew up in for the next generations. And through the foundation, he's able to do that. Being chairman of the foundation is an opportunity and a responsibility. And Ed takes it seriously, but not so serious that, oh, I've just got all these decisions to make and what am I going to do? There's a certain degree of humility that says, I'm not the only thing in this world. There was a period of time when the number of people who are homeless became very apparent in the city. And he would drive downtown every day 
and come into the office and say, I cannot stand to see this in our city. We have to be able to do better. Someone's got to help these people. We have many different programs here. And so we looked at the data and what we found was that there had been a pretty dramatic increase in the number of people experiencing homelessness and using Brother Francis shelter. And we needed to have a conversation in the community about it. And I remember saying, well, Ed, you're totally right, but this isn't something we can just make a grant for. If you really want to solve this, this is going to be years and years and years of work. We're going to need to get partners. We're going to need to have other people buy into this. And he was, let's do it. I'm the largest single provider of homes in Alaska. And Ed and I had had several conversations about the homeless issue in Anchorage, Alaska. I pledged 10 million, which matched the uh, Rasmussen grant. And uh, Ed brought in two other participants uh, as well, which gave us a total of 40 million. That's a good start. And we're doing it. It's slow, it's hard, but we're gonna succeed. And it was Ed who said, I can't see this, do something about it. Ed is a doer. I would join Ed in almost anything because he knows how to get things done. I'm not a really a super political person, but I'll say this, I'm Alaskan. I'm from here. And I wanna make sure that this state and my community are the best they can be. And I feel like I have that in common with Ed Rasmussen. I was born in Texas, but uh, we moved here in 1943 when I was a little over two years old. And my sister Lyle and myself and uh, mom and dad. I can remember being picked up at the railroad station by my aunt and uncle, as Bob and Evangeline Atwood. And then we moved to a home that was over on 1031 G Street, where the Presbyterian Church is right now. And it was a very small home, I think it was about 600 square feet. I can't say I remember the day we were introduced, but as far back as I can remember, I've known Ed. It was a small town back then, uh, town pretty well ended at 16th Avenue. The Rasmussen house was two doors down from ours. When we first moved here, it was only 3,500 people, then it grew to 5,000 and 8,000 and 10,000 and just kept on mushrooming, especially with the, the Cold War in, in the late 40s and early 50s. Really strained the city government. There wasn't that much for a young kid to do but roam the neighborhood. <laughs> we rode our bicycles, went down to Chester Creek and fished, what have you, and go out to the airfields and look at the airplanes. We lived on the ballpark there on the strip. The park strip was there is a little different than it is today. I mean it was this was during the war and it was it was a landing field. School was a big thing for us, and we, we spent a lot of time with our families. We were close neighbors, and we learned how to play chess together, played chess with his father. His father was a tough taskmaster. People have said to me, to know and appreciate Ed, you have to know Elmer, and I think there's a lot to that. Elmer was a, uh, a very moral, very, very strong-minded person. Um, I think a brilliant businessman. Elmer was, was very difficult to please. He was easily displeased. And if you were the one that caused the displeasure, you're gonna hear about it. And the amount of times you got caught up in that situation was directly in proportion to the amount of time you were around him. And Ed was around him a lot. It was not a pleasant experience growing up in, in, in Elmer's household. You children are the future of Alaska. Remember, the name of our state comes from the Aleut, Alaska, and it means the great land. <laughs> and if you're going to live up to the name of our state, you have to think big, 
and act big. On the other hand, uh, I think he loved us kids very much and he tried to uh, raise my sisters and myself in a manner that they would be self-reliant and take part in the society and take a lot of responsibility. Well, today, um, all, all of us have done it. It was tough going from time to time, but I often thought that together, uh, they formed a good team in running the bank. What they've built and what they've contributed to the state, you can't discount it. I don't think uh, there's another family that's, that's done more. Her mom was the rock of everything and very much loved by her children. Lyle Rasmussen, she was a, a, a very close friend of my mother's. She, she was a lovely lady. I, I never saw her get angry. She was a wonderful lady and loved by, by all the people who came in contact with her. She was very unique and she was able to, to calm dad down. And of course, he's, he was building a large organization from scratch, basically. As I got more and more involved with being the CEO of the bank, I could understand his emotional problems that he was going through. But the mom, she was the light of his life, and she was a very calming influence. She died when I was, um... 19. And it was a very traumatic experience for myself and for my sisters. I don't think we ever really got over it. It was a long illness. Everything and anything that could have been done for her was done for her. It was a very difficult thing to uh, go through to see your mom uh, over a period of seven or eight years slowly waste away for cancer. Seasons come and seasons go I'll stay by your side through the rain and the snow Tide And at that time you could just say, well, Lord, why take a beautiful person that's very well uh, accepted in the community and loved by, uh, by, by many, many people in our community away from us? Why should some people who are much more evil, why should they keep on living. When you go to the Bible, and the Bible says, you know, it's, it's, that happens. There's no such thing as a perfect existence. No such thing as a perfect place to live. Everything's a compromise. Don't take my heart. In the early 90s, Ed, through the bank, had made a donation to preserve film through the archives in the Rasmussen Library. So I was hired as a student to start on that project. I was struggling because we didn't have the proper storage. And the thing about being able to archive film, when you're looking at 100 years or 200 years, you have to have the proper storage. You have to have vaults that are temperature controlled and humidity controlled. And I didn't realize then that they actually had uh, quite an attachment to film, Alaska film, Alaska history also. And I explained the problem that we had, that we didn't have vaults, and vaults are the key to being able to pre preserve film. Then magically one day, he sent a check for what we needed to accomplish. And we were able to build two film vaults. It was fantastic. 
Until we had the vaults, we just had a collection of old film. As soon as we had the vaults, we were an archive. And it has created a legacy that a hundred years from now, people are gonna see things and learn things from the film. I sure hope they remember who Ed was, Ed and Catherine were, because they were the ones that put it together and they were the ones that saved this for everyone else. There are so many people in Alaska that Alaska is just a period of their lives. They come here, they work here for so many years, they retire and they move away. And Ed was not a transient. Ed was an Alaskan that would be an Alaskan to the day he died. I fell in love with Ed right at the beginning because he's loyal and he was kind and he was generous to anybody, whether it was a dog or the president of a company. He treated everybody equally. Ed and I got married on 9-11, 1969. I was best man at the wedding a little over 50 years ago. I was there the day after he met her. We went out together one time dancing at one of the tables at Sheffield's restaurant. You can ask Ed, I told him twice, I said, Ed, you better hang on to that. That's a good lady. I meet Ed at a party on Valentine's Day. I'd only been in Alaska for a week. We get engaged in June, and he tells his parents who like me, we're gonna get married in July. And of course, Elmer says, but we're going sailing. Well, then there was the opening day duck hunting, then there was the goose hunting, and then a sheep hunting, and then there's the deer hunting. So I sort of sat back and says, anytime you two boys can fit me in, let me know. So we got married on a Thursday, because Ed says, I don't want to waste a wedding and ruin a whole weekend for my friends are going to go duck hunting. Our rehearsal dinner was on September 10th, which was the day of the oil lease sale. There was not a room to be had in all of Anchorage. Every person from all over the United States that had to do with oil and finances was there. The wedding was very interesting. Kathy came into the wedding and bagpipe played. It was a fun wedding, but uh, nothing highfalutin. No, they're not highfalutin. Anchorage is Alaska's boom town. 121,000 people, nearly half the state's population, live in this area. Ed was the manager of the Spinard branch at that time. You couldn't keep any of your employees. They were all running off to the North Slope. They were getting fantastic wages, and it was just a new country. They were building everywhere. There was, streets were torn up and people were coming. It was actually very exciting because the oil men that they sent and their wives and their families came as an adventure. And what I liked about them is that they came to Anchorage and said, what can I do? So we, we grew with their energy. And of course, they all wanted to go fishing and Ed flew. And so there was many weekends he took some head honcho fishing. Of course, they all loved Ed. Ed was the honorary council for Sweden. So when the king of Sweden would come by on some trip, they would chit chat. Oh, Mr. Rasmussen, I'd love to come to Alaska with my boys and fish with them. And Ed says, well, you, you come anytime it's available. I'll take you here and I'll take you there. So every 10 or 15 years, they invite the American honorary ambassadors to Sweden for a trip and were wined and died. It was fabulous. Well, the last day is a meeting with the king. And he looks at Ed and he says, oh, Mr. Rasmussen from Alaska always wanted to go fishing in Alaska. And he says, well, I've invited you three times, you never came, so I'm not inviting you anymore. And there was that, <gasps> I just laughed and laughed at that, thinking, oh, that is so Ed. 
We call him a sophisticated nerd. He loves history and he loves weather, the weather channel. Back in 2000, that was when we had the biggest snow. And then he loves Westerns, loves them. Fire in the court! And has seen them all, many times. Sing, cowboy, sing. So everything is wrong. Round up trouble with a song. Sing, cowboy, sing. I met Ed when I was dating Natasha. And I was a fishing guy, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life, and Ed was the CEO of a bank. I finally got the courage up to ask Ed and Kathy for Natasha's hand. I told them of my plans to marry their daughter, their oldest daughter, and I wasn't sure what to expect. And the first thing out of Ed's mouth, he said, so let me get this straight. If I shoot a moose and it's down, you'll come help me pack it out? And I said, well, yeah, of course I would do that. And he said, done. Six, seven minutes flying time, I can be away from Anchorage in, 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 a, in a very rural setting. Dad bought the original lot, or actually squatted on it, uh, in 1944. And uh, we owned five and a half acres, and when we got statehood, we were allowed to, uh, to buy the lot. We weren't allowed to have the lot uh, before statehood, it was territorial days. We built this new cabin in 1991. Anyway, this is uh, one of our three docks. This is our party barge. This is the most expensive log cabin ever built in Alaska without running water and electricity. We've uh, put solar in there, and it's really been nice. Got all the features at home here. You've got six inches of uh, insulation in the ceiling, the six in the floor. All the windows are thermopane, and uh, we have a nice stove. It's heated by wood. Wood fired here and wood fired over there. And then we have over on this side, kind of L shape, we have the bunk rooms. So uh, we have a room here of Kathy and I. We've got about anything you really want. Here's what the old cabin looked like. That's dad, this is my grandmother fishing, my dog Trigger, and my our, our older sister and younger sister, and my mom and myself chopping wood and the bears and all that. Over here is uh, of myself in 1947, I guess it might say, uh, with my sister Lyle and my sister Judy with fish we caught. We've got everything here we want. I built it so that uh, the prevailing winds are from the southeast, so we can sit right here with our chairs and just enjoy life. Memories of uh, my father and mother taking us over in a small aircraft uh, back in the 40s. They had to t take two trips or three trips to get our family together and our dog and what have you. And so we'd go here almost every weekend with mom and dad and my two sisters. We just enjoyed the heck out of it. And the memories of uh, raising my children here, my three, my three children, and they just loved it over here. I own another property on the other side there that uh, someday I'll give to my kids. Whoever stays in Alaska gets it. They're having their fun. Ha! Jeez. 
Oh, it'll be young again, huh? He plays a mean game of dominoes, of cards, poker. He's very competitive. Is Erasmuson not competitive? I, it just is part of who we all were. But Ed is inordinately kind. I think that's what I always remember as a child, how, how very kind he is. And I think of him as an adult that way. I'm five years younger than he is, and Miles two years younger. And if you look at old pictures, you will always see me cuddled next to Ed. I always try to stand next to him because he was, he was it. He um, was very gregarious, still is. I mean, he is a very gregarious person. And he had lots of friends, and he had lots of friends from all different areas and walks of life. I'm Tom, nice wonder, next door neighbor for many years. We raised our kids together and went through all the trials and tribulations of uh, trying to get them launched. And we competed on tomatoes. <laughs> and unfortunately for me, he usually went out on uh, who had the best tomato crops. One of the very interesting uh, pieces of our relationship is that here's this uh, conservative Republican banker and a former Peace Corps volunteer. <laughs> and in fact, Ed has called me his token liberal. <laughs> and we've, uh, I mean, he's one of, actually one of my closest male friends. Ed, I mean, he takes a larger view of life, compassion for others, interest in others, um, T taking care of other folks, irregardless of politics. It's at the personal level where you find out who Ed really is. Ed, I think uh, he, he got some of the best qualities of his father as far as uh, decisiveness and um, intellect. And I think from his mother, he got, he got a real caring side. We've seen that personally in our family. Chrissy, our youngest, 2017 when she got cancer, and my part of trying to do something right was the real men wear pink, and I came in number one in the nation. My two biggest supporters were uh, Ed and Kathy. We met each other through Rotary. Ed does not miss a weekly meeting. No matter where in the world, he's one of those unique individuals that has a 100% attendance. And that shows a tremendous amount of commitment on his part. Rotary International is a uh, service organization whose goal is to promote the world understanding, peace, goodwill, and and fellowship and it currently has around 1.2 million members in alaska that boils down to involvement with the community I mean, as simple as going out as ed does by the way <laughs> and doing a road cleanup and he rolls up his sleeves he also has been very very involved and generous with the rotary foundation which is eradicating polio I think he has that rare ability to listen. A lot of times people are so anxious to say something that they miss what's going on. And I think Ed can, Ed listens and he reacts. Ed Rasmussen is a political conservative and gave $25,000 to a group that supported Republican Mike Dunleavy in his successful bid to become governor last year. But then Dunleavy proposed steep cuts to social services and other government programs, and among other cuts, Dunleavy vetoed about 40% of the university system's funding. Now, Rasmussen says he regrets voting for Dunleavy and supporting his campaign. Very disappointed in his 
overall handling of our state to say that we have to have a $3,000 dividend no matter what. It's just wrong. It's just not the right thing to do. And all I have to do is uh, look at the homeless and the problems of the nonprofits, what they have to go through. And it's a mess. I've been in Alaska for 75, 76 years, and, and uh, our family has been uh, here for over 120 years. And we're very committed uh, to our state. I don't like to see it torn down. That's wrong, absolutely wrong. It's uh, not the right way of handling uh, budget reduction. We're gonna have to start paying our own way. We're gonna have to start being more responsible. And uh, Ed gets that, he understands that, and he's committed to it. You know, on the one hand, he'll, with the investment strategy, he'll do some pretty, you know, conservative things. On the other hand, you know, he'll go out and do social things like taking on homelessness and taking on a governor. It's not one to be defined by any set conservative or liberal or what. It's just a guy who goes out and does, I think from his heart, what he thinks is right. So there's about 60 acres over by the Campbell Creek drainage that a private family had and they needed money to convert it into a park. Diane Kaplan and my dad and I went and visited it. So we're walking down there with our boots and I said, Dad, this is prime real estate. This is bluff views. My dad's like, you know what, Natasha? Sometimes you just have to put on your liberal hat. And I remember staring at him going, liberal hat? You own a liberal hat? And he's like, well, yes, that's, sometimes we have to put on your liberal hat. So, so think about this being available for all the people. And that's exactly what we did. And now it's a walking path with bird viewing platforms. And it's beautiful. Shut down the bar rooms cause I'm staying out tonight. Now that was when he was branch manager down in He was in Wrangell. Oh it's Wrangell, that's right. He was branch Wrangell. manager in Wrangell. Whenever he was branch manager there, he asked me if I would like, want to stop and see him. And I did. Yeah. It was unusual, to say the least. He was in his late 20s, early, middle 20s, middle 20s. And that's where I learned about his other life at the bar, which I think was the Elks Club at that point, was the only bar in town. And uh, we got there and had dinner and whatever you do when you're 20 years old. And somebody saying, Ed, Ed, sing Honky Tonk Angels. <laughs> So Ed did. So he did. Ed's got a beautiful voice. Yes, yeah, a great voice. Well, I'm sure I did a lot of that. I did in Ketchikan as well as in Wrangell. I was um, I was BC before Kathy, and I I certainly didn't. Um, uh, I wasn't a wallflower. I can tell you that. That's why I'm staying out tonight. It's fun sitting next to him in church. I mouth the words, Ed sings out in this clear baritone. I have a good voice and I'm just lucky to have it. But I uh, they don't sing professionally, but I just sing in uh, a church and I miss that right now. So anyway. I must have read the Bible maybe 10 times. I've read a chapter every day for 65 years now. I've got a carrying case for it, and, uh, and wherever I go, uh, the Bible's with me. You know, the one that I enjoy is the, the book of James. It talks about trials and temptations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously. And I pray uh, about four to five times a day. It's very um, soothing and uh, relaxing, and uh, I guess more than anything else, it's my commitment to my faith. The Lord has done so much for me and my family. I have a kind of a set routine in the morning that I've developed over the years. Certain parts of my life that I pray for, health, family, our nation. churches that I belong to, uh, the business that I'm involved with, the universities I'm involved with. So I pray for maybe about 10 different entities every day, seven days a week. He always leads prayer before dinner, whether there's five of us or 35 of us. Not because he's the most eloquent, but he's the most genuine at the table, expressing how really grateful we should be and how appreciative we should be for everything that we have. Almost every gathering I'm at, uh, they always ask me to give the prayer, and I'm very happy to do that. I ask him a good Presbyterian prayer. I find that um, I'm, I'm very upset with a lot of things that are going on. I feel very strongly that we should have a, a good government. Um, I'm fairly conservative, but I'm liberal on a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of issues, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, the foundation, but I find that uh, the, the Bible uh, brings me back to reality. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I don't see how you can go through life without a faith of some sort. We actually ran every morning. At six o'clock in the morning, rain or shine, and winter or summer, I think we stopped at about five below because our eyelashes would start to freeze up. He won't admit this, but I always let him win on the runs. <laughs> Coming up this hill here. The other fascinating thing was, we'd be running, and that guy would not run over a penny. He'd stop. He said, wait a minute, there's a penny on the ground. <laughs> the roots of the foundation and the family wealth came from Alaska. And it came basically from a hard-working Swedish immigrant that started a little bank. The National Bank of Alaska actually started as the Bank of Alaska in Skagway. My great-grandfather, E.A. Rasmussen, took over the bank in 1915. And he ran it until his death in 1949. And then my grandfather, Elmer Rasmussen, ran it for many, many years. And then my father took over in 1985 and grew the bank into the largest financial institution in Alaska with branches all over the state. I first started in the banking business when I was 16 or 17. I was making loans when I was 19 and an assistant manager when I was 20 or so, and so I learned along the way. I wasn't a fast learner, but I could see that chimes were changing and that we had to change with some of those times. I went to Harvard for four years, and then when Lou was going to Harvard Business School, went to New York, I started working at Brown Brothers Herman, and then to a chemical bank and I wanted to stay in New York. And Dad realized that and said, you gotta come on back. So I came back in, in October of 1964 and went from a city of 8 million to Ketchikan, it's a city of 8,000. Subsequently, I went to uh, Wrangell with 1,800 people and became the branch manager of Wrangell. That was a watch that was given to me by the city of Wrangell when I, uh, left Wrangell in 1967. And I was very fond of it, and, uh, and it's uh, broken a number of times, and I had it repaired. But it's a, uh, it's a very, I've got very fond memories 
of uh, my time in Wrangell in southeastern Alaska. Looking back in those days, it was exciting to be done the Wrangells of the world. My God, it was, the whole world was my oyster. So I'd go out on tugboats and I'd go out and hauling log rafts and identifying the types of equipment they were used so when they came in to run a finance company, I understood what they were trying to do. Oh, I learned how to deer hunt and to fish and to, did a lot of flying. I did a lot of traveling from Kitchka and Navarro. As a result, later on, I had a pretty good handle on what was happening in our state. And then well, my father said, well, you have to leave and go back to Anchorage. He said, I don't want to go back to Anchorage. Well, we'll, we'll promote you to a vice president. I don't want to be, I'm very happy where I'm at right now, but that's the way it's going to be. As a banker, I was conservative by nature, but I did t take some risks. One particular time that we really took the risk was uh, in the 1980s when, when a number of the uh, banks failed. For a period of about, I think it was 18 months, we took over five banks. And I could never have done it without the support of the people within the National Bank of Alaska. And I was very, very proud of them. They were outstanding. And uh, we developed, in my opinion, the finest organization in the state. No question about it. Elmer was very good at putting all the pieces together, but Ed is the one who I think gave the humanity to the bank. Um, he brought in women as vice presidents. He put women on the board. He brought in health care for all the employees. And Elmer cared about every employee and cared about his customers, but more as the patron does, looking after everybody who works for him. Ed cared for them as, hey, you're my partner and we got to work this out together. That way of running the bank was crucial to how he saw to run the foundation. And Ed, in particular, was about how can the foundation help others fulfill their dreams. I've never had a business relationship with Ed, but I asked him about how he made banking decisions. He said, what you really invest in is people and not necessarily the project, but it's the people that you're investing in that's most important. Ed was the, the very passionate skier in the early years, and so was his father. Ed basically grew up uh, here skiing here, and, uh, and later then uh, their kids, uh, especially uh, Natasha and Laura and uh, David. Going to Girdwood for skiing was really big. My father loved downhill skiing, and he got all of us kids on skis early. He taught me how to ski when I was three. We were going down the whole mountain at five. Rain or shine, we would go downhill skiing. This uh, roundhouse building was everything. It was a warming hut was, uh, where they could also have uh, sandwiches and soup, but eventually it was much too small. And now we have the new tram terminal, Glacier Express restaurant, and another fine dining room. But uh, to me, this still represents the history of the early years of Gerdwood and Alyeska. The around us was slated to be demolished after the new tram terminal was being built. And I told our staff that uh, I want to save the building to make it eventually a, a museum. Like so many other projects in the state of Alaska, Ed Rasmussen and the Rasmussen Foundation were a significant contributor to, to this uh, community and uh, uh, museum project. And the visitors, uh, summer and winter, come up here and learn about the history of Gerdwood and Alyeska. And uh, I'm forever grateful. He's also in his element when he's fishing. He's a very good fisherman. And how many times we've been fishing with him and if there's no kings, <laughs> if he hasn't caught a fish within 10 minutes. If he hasn't caught a fish. If he hasn't caught a fish. <laughs> now usually he catches the first and the biggest. But if he hasn't caught within 10 minutes or gotten a good bite, he says, ah, oh, there's no fish here. Hook him up, we're out of here. 
Ed has no patience with the fish if they aren't going to come and, and talk to them and be willing to be caught. That's right. That's right. Always been that way. Always. Yep. Elmer loved, he was at his best when he could teach us how to hunt and to fish. And I think Ed feels the same way, that when he is out in the woods, he's doing, first of all, what comes naturally to him, and he knows how to do everything from light a fire to string a fishing lure to skin a, a sheep. And he's happy to impart that knowledge with somebody else, to anybody else, and especially to the kids. I hunted sheep since I was uh, 12 years old, and uh, I quit hunting sheep when I was uh, 66, 67 years of age. But I hunted sheep almost every year. It's a t tough, tough hunt, but uh, it's exhilarating to be on the climb the mountains. Though uh, those sheep are tough to get, and uh, very few people get more than five or six. And I've hunted in Afghanistan, I've hunted in Mongolia, and you know I've hunted in Canada and Mexico and Alaska, and there's just there's nothing like it. There's hunting and there's sheep hunting. Ed suggested we go sheep hunting together with our wives, which we did. And we went down the Wrangell Mountains out of a place called Ptarmigan Lake. And um, that's when I, I probably got a new perspective of Ed. Ed was viewed as the son of a powerful, wealthy person and was um, expected by his dad to, to measure up. And um, he did, I think. Uh, he more than carried his own weight. There was a rite of passage that when you turned 13, you got to go duck hunting with my dad. And so my father and my grandfather and I all went over to the duck flats to hunt together. And I had been training, and my dad had been teaching me to shoot, and I could shoot that target. I was getting really good. Those tin cans flew off. But when I raised the rifle to shoot a duck, I couldn't pull the trigger. And my dad was very patient with me, and, and finally he said, that's okay. You don't have to shoot. And that was especially wonderful because my grandfather was there, and. And he sort of had this line where this is what's expected of you and you better do it. And my dad said, no. My dad said, I'm going to support you. Is that an apple? Is that an apple? I planted this about um, 25 years ago, and it's really grown up. And, and uh, as long as the moose, you know, moose can't get it. Oh, hi, hi Kathy. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Dad, this is my come together baskets. Oh. I, I named during I did them. So you've got uh, steelhead, and you've got uh, oh, uh, fish from uh, the Yukon, and then you've got yeah. uh, from. from or oh, Kenai. Yes. Yeah, and then this is this is the matching. This the oh. male counterpart of hers. the female. Yeah. Because this one has two vertebrae on each side. I call these ones come together, like uh -huh. to represent what's going on right now. Like the different colors of the skin sure. and our yeah. different colors of skin around yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Dentalia to represent the uh, status of our Athabascan chiefs. Oh, really? But okay. also the status of our First responders uh -huh. and providers. Oh, so, earrings. Yes. Oh, yeah. You can choose. I've been Barbers. busy with all, I don't waste anything. So, as you know, all your little skins, even the small pieces, everything goes to like Christmas ornaments okay. or okay. earrings I or brooches. I love these because I love the color. You love blue? Just the colors in them are so beautiful and big spots. Yeah, because I do a lot of piecing of, especially when I don't have big pieces. So I do a lot of piecing of skins. See, this is all what it looks like, you know. Oh, yeah. And so I, mm -hmm. you know, and you'll have this skin. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I'm so thankful. Thank oh, thank you. I think you're doing this. Yeah. I hope so. Alaska's been very transient and people come and then they leave and they might take pieces or histories with them that might disappear from Alaska and never find their way back. And I think there's something core about that that really bothers him. He's dedicated himself to making sure that somebody stays committed to them. So you can see that in, you know, the big splash of the museum edition, but you can also see that in the investment of the archives in Fairbanks and in protecting those narratives and protecting those things that someday will have greater value than they might now. We're in the Art of the North galleries of the Anchorage Museum. I will probably never forget those early conversations I had with Ed about building a new wing to the museum. And he was, you know, steadfast about what it was for, that these were going to be dedicated to the art of Alaska. He just said, it's enough is enough. We've got these great Alaskan masters, these Sidney Lawrences or these Fred Makatons. We, we got to be showing these works of theirs that uh, are not being shown and they're sitting in uh, the basement of the Anchorage Museum, and and uh, we don't have enough space, and I want to I want to change that so that Alaskans can enjoy them. He moved very quickly, gathered best engineers, get you know gathered the architects. That was 100 percent it. I always talk about this as an aspirational space because for us as a museum, um, they're grand galleries, they're beautiful spaces. The good news is that uh, we build an addition that will take care of the paintings for the near future as well as in the, in the far future. We don't know what's going to happen 50 years from now, but we certainly have the, uh, the wall space to take care of anything in the foreseeable future. And that's my uh, swan song. I'm very pleased to be able to finally present these Papal Benner Marenti medals to Ed and Kathy Rasmussen. There's all kinds of ways of giving back. Now I look back and see what we've done and I'm very proud of it. Their commitment and their support over many years to the Catholic Church and to so many individuals in need within Anchorage and our state of Alaska is well known and greatly appreciated by all. Knowing that we have tried to be a good stewards of our state and uh, tried to help develop a better place for everyone to live, that to me is it's a lasting legacy.
we go. Pain or strain, huh?